Hello, and welcome to SciliaDB's very first webinar, How to Achieve No Compromise Performance and Availability. I'm Julia Angel, the Marketing Director here at SciliaDB. If you have questions for our presenters or technical issues with the webinar, please use the chat window located on the lower left corner of the console. Today's broadcast will last approximately 60 minutes, and the recording, the deck, and links to resources will be sent to you after the broadcast. Today's webinar is presented by SciliaDB's co-founders, Dor Lauer and Avi Kaviti. And with that, I'm going to hand the meeting over to Dor so we can get started right away. So take it away, Dor. Thank you, Vant. Thank you very much, Julia. And uh, hi, Avi, and thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, it's pretty exciting for us. It's the first webinar that we do. We have the countdown that looks like uh, the Challenger launch. Hope it will be a bit more successful than the Challenger. So without further ado, let's go to the agenda. Um, throughout the webinar, we have a Q&A window, and you, you are able to post chat questions on it, and we'll promote them to questions and may get them answered while we go or maybe towards the end. Uh, let me congratulate Avi for his birthday. You, you can test the Q&A by uh, providing birthday wishes to him. So today we are going to cover an introduction. I guess you already know who you are, who we are, and we're going to cover why we started Silla, and mainly most of the webinar will focus around the design decision that made Silla what it is. Uh, at, at the end, why you care, a very nice demonstration about running Silla cluster on Docker, and finalize with a Q&A. So uh, some history. I mean, Avi and I actually uh, go uh, way long. Uh, we know each other for 12 years. And I'm the um, handsome folks between the, the two of us. Uh, we met each other 12 years ago at a startup that was called Permanet. Uh, it pivoted several times, and eventually Avi came up with a really neat and clean way how to design a hypervisor. After all of the other hypervisors were already uh, relatively mature, eventually KVM became, I'd say, its standard, and that startup was acquired by Red Hat, where we continue our journey to promote even further the KVM hypervisor. And four and a half years ago, we left Red Hat to uh, spin our own company. Initially, we had to pivot as well. That, that was quite of a journey, but uh, uh, let's, uh, it, it was almost three years ago, so let, let's focus uh, this webinar about uh, CIDADB. It's a nice story anyway. Um, so we were doing databases for the past uh, three years, almost, we, the clock from a stealth mode at the Cassandra Summit 2015. Uh, the database is on general availability for more than a year with uh, uh, customers running in production for a year and a half. We had a quite a good initial Scylla Summit and we intend to repeat that this year. Uh, recently we completed our funding announcement and we have headquarters in Palo Alto, California and Israel. Uh, we have around 35 people around the world, uh, spread across 14 countries. Uh, that's quite unique and, and a topic for a webinar by itself. Uh, we're pretty proud of our, of our team, and many of them go a uh, long way with us. Some of them just learned with me uh, BA and MSc degrees uh, in the Technion Institute for 22 years ago. Um, so we're quite happy about that. Many of them have been developing virtualization and kernel technologies. Uh, we have two folks who have written JVNs. So quite a lot of knowledge, but uh, we were new to the database world, and, and we're very intrigued by it. And the more we go with our journey, the more we're excited about that. So as you probably know, Scylla is a NoSQL database. It's a re-implementation of uh, Apache Cassandra, and it's compatible but way faster. Uh, we're trying to head towards becoming the best NoSQL technology, both in the, the outcome and the value and in terms of adoption. 
uh, the journey began three, three years ago, but it's still quite long. We believe the product is in, already in the number one spot, but it's not for us to determine the, the ranking. Um, when you use Scylla, you get to enjoy all of the goodies of Cassandra, which made it number one in high availability. Uh, Cassandra and Scylla can scale to hundreds and even thousands of nodes in a single cluster. All of the nodes are homogenous, so it's relatively easy to scale. The replication factor is so flexible that you can control it on a table in, in even by a query basis, and it has multi-data center uh, out-of-the-box uh, support. It has a lot of other features in a vibrant open source community around that that creates uh, third-party tools and integrates well with uh, Spark, Presto, and uh, onwards. Uh, unlike Cassandra, we can uh, execute one million operations per second per node and provide really, really low tail latency. And we do a bunch of other things like automatic tuning that we'll soon cover. There are plenty of usages of Scylla today from blue chip companies to small companies, uh, ad tech, social, even infrastructure who is built uh, with the help of Scylla. And I urge you to uh, test Scylla today if you haven't been doing that already. Uh, Scylla provides benefits even for small deployments, uh, for small and large deployments. So let's go into the greater length of uh, uh, why we started Scylla and the design decision behind them. So, Ali, do you think that something is wrong with this picture? Uh, yes, Dor. So the answer is a server sprawl. Uh, for a long time, the NoSQL world has focused on scale out, the ability to add more nodes, more servers as your load grows in order to handle that load. Uh, but there was very little focus on scale-up or on efficiency. And the result was uh, very large clusters. Uh, and the effect of this uh, is, first of all, the obvious uh, the high cost, uh, whether the cost to acquire those servers or to rent them from a cloud. Uh, but also there is a lot of the management cost and complexity to, to manage, manage all of those servers uh, and all of the problems that arise from failures uh, the more servers you have, the more likely to have a failure uh, in any given day, uh, and then you have to recover from that failure. Uh, so there is a, are a lot of problems associated with uh, low efficiency. And we set out to, to address this problem and build a database that can both scale out as is normal with uh, NoSQL, but also scale up uh, to take advantage of uh, modern hardware. And uh, this uh, benchmark uh, by, by Samsung uh, Memory Solutions Lab demonstrates the, the, the difference. And here you can see uh, B in green uh, versus uh, Cassandra, uh, Cassandra 3 in uh, red for various uh, YCSB workloads. YCSB is a standard benchmark for NoSQL databases. And you can see here a, a factor of uh, uh, 10 to 1 and even 20 to 1 in some workloads and this is what you can achieve on, on modern hardware. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's important to note that uh, when you benchmark Scylla, then th the better the hardware, the better and the more significant the difference between Cassandra and Scylla would be. Um, you can run it on small virtual machine, large virtual machine, physical, and Docker. Uh, make sure that when you benchmark, then that you are aware what's the bottleneck. And uh, we, we do a lot of wonders with Scylla, but it's not possible to go beyond physical limitations. So bear that in mind. And unlike uh, the Cassandra project that uh, urged you to scale out and increase the number of nodes and use, using smaller nodes, we urge you to do the opposite and use as large as possible nodes. Uh, not only that the outcome and the efficiency uh, of the whole system will be better, also the manageability of this, this cluster will be simplified. So uh, Scylla is mainly around performance, throughput, latency, and efficiency. But over time, we understood that we can provide more value to the user. Uh, it starts with, with uh, 
SLA between background and foreground tasks because it's important to provide not just good performance but also stable performance over time that uh, your performance graph stay, stays the same without uh, spikes. And in addition, it's important to work on any given hardware. It's nice to demand very big machines, but sometimes it's just not possible. So we're trying to dynamically tune and uh, try to shine on any given hardware. And we also try to make sure that we deliver the best 99% latency, which uh, many times is important and uh, important for your business results as well. Uh, another interesting aspect is uh, performance on the face of failures. Not only that we rather not lose any messages during failures, we also make sure that uh, we will keep the low latency when there are failures, when we stream data to newer joining nodes, and when those nodes join the cluster but their uh, CPU caches and disk caches may, may be cold, and now we have uh, a unique way to load balance and prioritize hotter nodes than colder nodes that just rejoin. Altogether, in terms of uh, classes of advantages, there are the throughput and efficiency class. There is the latency class. We try to remove any layer out of the equation to provide you low and consistent latency. Uh, important aspect, which is hard to measure, but uh, we certainly know that we can simplify user deployments by reduction of tuning times. Our methodology is to decrease the amount of nodes, not just allow plenty of nodes, because each node that you add, it's at least doubles, if not more, the configuration options. Uh, we try to dynamically schedule, so to match your uh, varying workloads requirements. And lastly, there is administration. Uh, it's complex to administer a distributed system, and nodes should be added uh, to it, resting with uh, remote data centers, etc. And it's important while you do that, you'll be able to provide great SLA to your foreground operations. And that's a quite important uh, design criteria. So without further ado, let's skip the intro and move towards the design decisions which made Sela what it is. And we'll start with uh, not a big surprise, uh, the C++ language. Uh, Avi, why did we pick C++? And, and does the gains come from it? Uh, yes, Dor. So uh, uh, indeed, when we uh, announced our uh, 10x uh, performance gains over Cassandra, and we mentioned that we use uh, C++, people uh, expressed their disbelief that uh, C++ can provide such a gain. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, you don't see it a 10 times performance difference between Java uh, and uh, C++. Uh, there is a, a performance difference, but it's not that large. Uh, instead, what uh, C++ gives us is control. Uh, it allows you to control uh, when you allocate memory, uh, where you allocate it from, uh, when you free it, there is no garbage collector. Uh, it allows you to control the placement of threads and, and exactly what you do at any given point. Uh, and by having this control, uh, this is an enabling technology that allows us to build everything on top of that. Uh, so uh, while Java is a great language for building applications, uh, it's not so good for systems programming because you relinquish a lot of the controls to the runtime layer. And by using uh, C++, uh, we were able to have uh, full control over the environment. Uh, now, there are other uh, systems languages. languages. Uh, one example is C, uh, in which uh, the kernel is written. Uh, so obviously, it's a great language for uh, systems programming, uh, but it's not really suitable for uh, writing uh, more complex abstractions, which are required in a, da in a database. Uh, Scylla is written in an asynchronous way, and for that we use the Lambda feature of uh, C++, which is not really available in C. And by using a modern language, uh, we were able to uh, simplify our code by quite a lot. Um, uh, to take a different example, uh, the Go programming language, which is promoted by Google for systems programming, is a little bit 
allows you a little bit less control. It still runs with a garbage collector. Uh, it comes with its own scheduler uh, so that uh, it, gives, it takes away that bit of control from you. Uh, perhaps uh, if we started today, we might have considered uh, Rust, but at the time we started, Rust was not uh, mature enough. Uh, perhaps now it is a contender for uh, such projects. As a side note, Avi tests the assembly code to see that C++ doesn't add anything, any additional um, um, overheads, and it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, a second uh, design decision we made is to be 100% uh, compatible. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's very easy uh, for people to migrate from Cassandra to Silver this way and also to take advantage of uh, the wide the ecosystem. Uh, layered products like Presto and Spark uh, can run on uh, SilaDB in the same way they run on, on Cassandra, uh, only faster. And I'll enumerate what, it, what we mean by compatibility. So first, of course, is the SSTable file format. It's the same format, which means that you can take SSTables from a Cassandra cluster uh, and run them on a Scylla cluster, and also vice versa. The configuration file format is the same, so if you have a configured Cassandra cluster, you can just copy the configuration file over and, and use it to start the Scylla. Uh, the SQL language is the same, and that means that your applications don't need to change. Uh, the queries that work with the Cassandra will work with Scylla. Uh, the native protocol between the application and the database uh, is the same, and that means that your drivers don't need to change, and indeed we don't have our own drivers. You use the, the same drivers that you use with Cassandra. They will work just the same way with the Scylla. Uh, even though we are written in C++, so we use the JMX management protocol uh, so that if you have a metrics collection or a management tools that are tied to JMX, they will continue to work with the Scylla. And the management command line, the no tool command, uh, works exactly the same way in Cassandra and in Scylla so that if you have some training or if you have some scripts around no tool, then uh, they will continue to work in exactly the same way and you don't need to learn anything new. So we take compatibility very, very seriously. Um, this slide shows a visualization of uh, uh, the different threading models of uh, Cassandra and Scylla. Uh, now, there aren't actually uh, little puppies in the code, but this is just a visualization, but it demonstrates uh, how threads are scheduled onto cores. In Cassandra, and indeed in many uh, applications, it's not unique to Cassandra, uh, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between the threads and the cores. And that means that the scheduler keeps, have to keep making decisions on where to place uh, a thread uh, to find a core for it. And a core might be uh, occupied, uh, so the thread might need to be scheduled uh, in another place. These kind of applications are written with a, a lot of locks. Uh, so you have lock contention, and that causes more confusion and more inefficiency. Uh, uh, to contrast, uh, Scylla is built on a thread per core model, and we call those shards. Uh, each uh, uh, thread has one core bound to it, and vice versa. Every core has exactly one thread uh, that it runs on, so there is never any cause uh, for the scheduler to switch threads between different cores, they are bound. Uh, and similarly, each um, uh, core, each thread has its own memory. So it has its own private memory uh, that it controls and manages uh, on behalf of the rest of, of the system. Uh, it's similar to um, the cluster as a whole. In the same way that uh, uh, different nodes don't share any data except across the network, uh, different cores in a Scylla node don't share any data except through message passing. And we will expand a little bit on that in the next slide. So this is a block diagram view of, of the two systems. And again, uh, the traditional stack that Cassandra uses is not really uh, unique to Cassandra. Uh, it's uh, used almost everywhere in applications. And, and here you see uh, the many threads that are multiplexed uh, across uh, the hardware. And it is the kernel's job to do this multiplexing. Uh, and it needs to multiplex both the cores via the scheduler and also the memory. Whenever a thread needs to allocate memory, uh, the kernel has to decide uh, where the memory comes from and uh, to allocate that memory. And also the TCP IP stack, it has to manage uh, networking for, um, for the application. Uh, and because the, uh, on modern machines you have 
a large number of cores and you have a large number of threads, this is a, a, a source of a lot of inefficiency. Uh, in contrast, in um, uh, Scylla, we have a replicated stack. So each core and each box represents uh, a core uh, has uh, its own task scheduler that multiplexes between tasks that run within a core. Uh, and they talk uh, via a DMA to the hardware, either the disk or the networking. And, and they're connected via point-to-point -point queues to each other. So every pair of cores uh, has a queue uh, that allows them to uh, pass messages and coordinate the work. Uh, there is never a case where one core accesses the data that is managed by another core directly. Uh, here is uh, yet another view of, uh, of how threads and tasks, uh, until a task are different. Uh, so in a traditional application like Cassandra, uh, the state of a particular transaction is stored in, in the stack. Uh, and you have uh, uh, the stack is fairly large. It contains all of the state uh, that is used for the particular operation. Uh, and when that uh, operation needs to block, for example, when it accesses uh, the disk, uh, then uh, the scheduler has to pick another thread, and all of that state uh, moves out of cache, and when it uh, 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 moves back to the thread, it has to reload all of that state from, uh, from the stack. And this is uh, quite inefficient, and uh, a context switch can cost uh, many microseconds, uh, which is a lot when you're trying to do um, a million operations per second. Uh, if we compare with the Scylla, then um, a, a task is a lot smaller. It is a, a few dozen bytes, uh, and it contains just the state that is needed to process uh, the previous uh, I.O. operation and to start a new one. A, a transaction is basically just a series of I.O. operations, uh, and what uh, Scylla does is simply uh, issue tasks uh, that uh, link between those I.O. operations until completion. So the amount of uh, state that has to be saved and restored uh, is a lot smaller and the contact switcher are consequently faster. Sure. As you can see, so CI is quite different in its extreme implementation of the sharding per core scheme because it allows you to have lockless, uh, low latency, and uh, zero copy uh, efficiency. Now, so, sometimes we actually want to get the maximum performance because of this design. Sometimes we just need to go all the way because the design is fully asynchronous and no core can block and no resource can get locked. So we, we must need to get this into perfection in order to get the best result out of your hardware. And that's what we constantly do. There is a lot of uh, additional details into it. We won't go into cover all of them. But in this slide, I'll pick uh, the log structure allocator. So we couldn't even use a re regular malloc with the shard per core. Each core has a subset of the regular RAM, and uh, it cannot use regular malloc because regular malloc grabs a spin lock in order to allocate memory. So in our case, uh, we modified malloc, and we have our own malloc that obeys shard per core. So each uh, thread of execution within that shard, it's a single thread in a shard, is independent. In addition, we apply the log structure design to this allocator, so we'll manage our own memory allocation. It's like a kernel that owns the entire memory and grabs uh, and divides the memory into the applications. Uh, in a similar way, each of our internal shards own the subset of, of the RAM and allocates memory to the different tiny tasks that uh, are, are scheduled by the scheduler that Avi described. Uh, going to the disk and the block cache, we apply the regular log structured uh, file system design uh, by Cassandra, but we greatly improve the caching aspects of it. As you can see on the left-hand side, Cassandra has a plethora of caches that begin with the reliance on, on the Linux page cache and continues with the row cache and key cache, and they have off heap structures because they try to get away from Java and GC. Uh, so the main problem is it's complex to almost impossible to configure all of these settings correctly. And even if you manage to configure them correctly, uh, then once you're 
workload changes, then you need to reconfigure them, or you apply um, the cluster on a different hardware set, then you need to reconfigure again and again and again. And, again. and that's a tremendous problem. So mostly you won't enjoy from the best performance that Cassandra has to offer, and you'll spend a lot of time configuring them. Uh, in Scylla, it's not the case. We have one unified cache that we control. Uh, we, we try to grab all of the memory that uh, is, is within the machine. It's also possible to just give us a number and you run some other workload in that machine, but it's relatively simple to configure. But it's not just about uh, simplicity. It's also about performance and, and efficiency. So because of the Cassandra project relies on the Linux page hash, they cache objects within 4K granularity. But if the object is small, like a 300 bytes raw, then you're going to waste all of this 4K area, and th that will be a shame. You can host their additional hot objects. And this is exactly what Scylla does. It just caches the objects themselves without an additional overhead. And it's not just about cache efficiency. It's about CPU and latency efficiency, because Cassandra isn't aware that uh, data isn't in the page cache. It just accesses the data. Now, if the data is there, then uh, it will just be in memory. But if the data isn't there, then the Linux kernel will issue a page fault. And that causes the running thread to be suspended, no matter which lock did, it, did that thread own or what other tasks are pending and queued on that thread, it will be just suspended. And a new IO context will be brought to life to bring the, the data to the kernel. And eventually, when the data will asynchronously come back, then another page fault will happen in order to schedule in that thread. So a lot of uh, actions, uh, inefficiency, and additional latency. And it's not the case with Scylla, because we control our cache. We know that objects aren't in the cache. When objects aren't in the cache, we issue asynchronous DMA to bring them with a continuation that we schedule, and we can run million continuation per core. So it's quite efficient, and it does provide the benefit. Avi? All right. Uh, this slide should be uh, familiar to, to those of you that have run Cassandra. And there are a lot of such tunables in Cassandra where you have to configure uh, the bandwidth of uh, certain operations. Uh, for example, uh, streaming and compaction, you have to tell uh, Cassandra uh, at what rate it needs to, to compact. Uh, and, and that is problematic because there is really no right value. Uh, if you set it uh, uh, too low, then uh, a compaction can uh, fall behind, uh, and you will have a lot of small SS tables, and that will uh, impact your read performance. Your read will become slow. If you set it uh, too high, um, then uh, compaction might come to dominate the disk and the CPU bandwidth, and you will have uh, uh, no resources available to serve your regular read and write requests. Uh, but you can't really find the best value because it keeps changing over time. Uh, it depends on the actual load that's running now. It depends on your compaction backlog. It depends on whether you're doing uh, streaming or not. Uh, so there is no right value. Uh, what uh, uh, Scylla does, uh, by contrast, is dynamically measure the resource consumption from uh, all of the consumers uh, be the uh, compaction and or and the query and the write and balance uh, between those different consumers, uh, and it can adjust the the, uh, the proportional of shares that uh, each uh, the consumer gets from the disk and from the CPU, and that allows us to isolate the different uh, workloads. And uh, this slide shows exactly how we do it. Uh, in the graph, we see the concurrency response uh, uh, of the disk. This is an NVMe SSD. Um, on the x-axis is the concurrency. Uh, so uh, we start with a small amount of concurrent requests and increase it. And on the y-axis is the bandwidth. And you can see that as you increase the bandwidth, the, the throughput, the concurrency, the throughput increases, uh, but up to a limit. Eventually, it reaches a, a plateau at around a, a concurrency of 150, and then the bandwidth does not increase. What does increase uh, is the latency, which you can see in red, uh, and uh, what you get from increasing the concurrency 
it's just um, uh, that uh, throughput does not grow, but latency does. Uh, and what we do in Scylla is that when you set it up, it runs a, a, a quick benchmark to determine exactly where this sweet spot is, and it makes sure that the disk never sees more than that amount of requests uh, concurrently. And that places a bound on the latency. And in addition, uh, because we queue all of the access requests in user space, it gives us control over which request uh, gets to access the disk next. So if you have a, a compaction running and it's queuing up a lot of uh, read and write requests in order to uh, compact those access tables, and in addition you have a lot of queries running, uh, our scheduler can select um, uh, that the query uh, queue will get, to will get access to the disk next, and this way it allows uh, queries to bypass the compaction, and it will also be vice versa in some situations, uh, and that allows you to uh, have control over the latency and over the bandwidth that each, um, each uh, such task uh, gets. And this is the, the result of um, uh, allowing uh, Scylla to control uh, the bandwidth that's used by compaction and by queries. Uh, this is a benchmark that was run by Kenshu, and you can see that the uh, 200 gigabyte compaction uh, was a lot faster in Scylla because it is simply able to use all of the available disk bandwidth when there is no query running, uh, and also repair is uh, significantly faster. Uh, yet another uh, uh, design decision we made was to expose all of the metrics that we collect uh, to the user. So these are all metrics that we use to control Scylla internally, but they're also available to you. And, and you can see things like um, the amount of memory in use by mem tables and cache, uh, the request rate, uh, the cache hit rate, uh, the bandwidth that is used by different scheduling classes. For example, you can see the bandwidth that is dedicated uh, to query, to compaction, and to the commit log and see that the latency, the latency for each queue, uh, so there is a wealth of information that you can uh, gain from this and understand exactly what is going on uh, with your workload. Uh, back to you, Dor. Um, thanks. So there are additional design decisions that we group them under the term workload conditioning. Uh, it's a, it's an umbrella of algorithms that uh, is there in order to apply back pressure when needed, either memory back pressure or uh, virus communication back pressure. And these back pressures control the dynamic priorities of uh, the output of the virus producers and affect the scheduling. And we won't go, go over the, in this webinar. We have already blogged about that in the past, and you're encouraged to check our blog. We're also recently completed uh, another algorithm that uh, load balances uh, the hot cache among the replicas, and we'll blog about that in, in the upcoming uh, weeks. So I urge you to stay tuned to our blog. Uh, just to show that how it's applied in practice, so this diagram shows results from uh, our RAM cons consumption and correlates with the total request. So when you initially start to hit Scylla with a a large workload, initially the, we will start to uh, apply lots of requests and the throughput will be large. But uh, qu quite uh, some time, uh, not a lot of time afterwards, when memory will pile up and we'll need to flush a lot of memory into the disk, we'll have to slow down. Uh, some systems do that while suffer from spikes, spikes and valleys in their graphs. We try to apply dynamic uh, back pressure in order to flatten the graph. And if you see when you run Pisnet, when you run Scylla, uh, you see the, the behavior spike and it's not originated in your applications, you're welcome to uh, uh, report the bug. It's not the case that needs to be in Scylla. We're also trying to flatten the effect of uh, compactions and uh, node failures, repair, etc. So oh, um, the question here asks, why should you care? I think it's uh, quite trivial, uh, so we won't explain that. What we'll cover a case study by Outbrain. Uh, Outbrain runs Scylla in production for quite some time. 
they are the largest content discovery platform with millions of active users and billions of uh, watch pages. Uh, initially, they applied Cassandra. They suffered from uh, pay latency, so and Cassandra couldn't keep up. It wasn't even economic at the time, so they added the Memcache cluster in front of the Cassandra. So uh, when uh, reads are applied, they first try to uh, provide them from Memcache and not from Cassandra, and they only go to Cassandra in case there is a cache miss from the Memcache. Uh, it's better than what they had before, but still they suffer from stale data in the caches. It's more complicated and it's moved the complexity to the developer and not to the database and that's wrong. Uh, when there are failures in the cache, then uh, Cassandra gets all of the workload and, and it cannot keep up. And what isn't in, in here, it's even the cache high availability properties aren't as good as the Cassandra one and, uh, and, and like problematic failures may impose cases where weren't tested before. So they wanted to move to Scylla, and uh, if you cannot take your cluster down and install Scylla on the very same machines, uh, you can apply different techniques of, to, to do that online without using any transaction, and this is by running a parallel cluster. So they added the Scylla cluster that runs in, other pa in parallel to the Cassandra and the Memcached clusters, uh, the idea is that uh, Scylla doesn't have a cache in front of it, just, just Cassandra, and Scylla is accessed directly. Writes goes to both clusters, and the same goes with uh, the reads. And the results were quite good, and Scylla managed to, ma to sustain 12 million requests per minute, while the Cassandra cluster in, in the same size only manage 500,000 re requests per minute because most of the, uh, the difference between the two went to the memcache. Scylla, again, doesn't have the memcache. Uh, the overall average latency with Scylla versus Cassandra plus memcache is still better. It's twice as good, and the maximum latency is four times better. Um, in the present, we shrink down the Scylla cluster, so in a ratio of uh, it, it's uh, 30 uh, machine cluster with a ma spread across three data centers, so 10 each. So we reduce the 10 to three machines while we sustain the same level of performance. So you get to have better efficiency and, and cost reduction, better latency, and re reduction in complexity, and uh, better high availability in your cluster. So it's pretty much mean the same for non-Cassandra users. Uh, Non-Cassandra users will need to modify their uh, client code, but I think it's worth the effort because you get the throughput and the latency gains as well as scaling gains that aren't there with uh, regular uh, uh, NoSQL databases. Sometimes these databases require you to, when you reshard in order to auto-scale, require to take the cluster down. And it's not, certainly not the case with us. Uh, we enjoyed for a wide set of uh, integration with big data tools. And uh, at the end of the day, we see movement of people who consolidate AIDS and Redis and uh, Cassandra into a single database. Uh, so it's nice to see this transition. And now let's go, switch into uh, an active demo uh, by Avi. And go ahead, take the controls, and, and uh, share your screen. Um, thanks, Dor. And um, I'll, I'll use Docker for this demo simply because it's uh, simple and easy to, to get up running in no time. And I'll share my terminal. Um, I hope you can, uh, you can all see it. Uh, so because we're using Docker over a desktop machine, uh, we won't be breaking uh, any um, uh, any performance records, uh, but I will demonstrate uh, how easy it is to get up and running, and we will simulate some failures and see how Scylla recovers from them. So we will start by pulling the image from the Docker repository with the Docker pull command. And it pulls the image. Actually, it was already there. 
but uh, you have to start somewhere. And we will uh, run a node. We'll give it a name. And the dash D flag puts it in the background. Give the image name. And now we give a few parameters. By default, Scylla will consume all of the memory on the machine and all of the cores. Uh, so we will uh, limit it so that we will have some left over for the other nodes. All right, so uh, we launched uh, the first node, and uh, we can uh, look at its uh, IP address so that we can launch other nodes. All right, let's put that in a convenience variable. Uh, so now let's uh, launch uh, a second node and tell it to connect to the first node. So the command uh, starts very similar. And we also tell it to access the first node in order to connect to the cluster. Whoops, I forgot to put it in the background. That wasn't clever. I'll just kill it. Looks like we have someone in the audience that uh, <laughs> knew that immediately. Yeah, I'll just I'll just remove node one as well just to make sure that I start with a clean slate and do that again. All right, that's the first node. Make sure that they have the same address so I can start the second node. And we can, we can now use the, the node tool command to see uh, whether the, the second node has joined. So we can see the first node is in the up status, and the, st uh, the state is normal, uh, so it hasn't seen the second node yet. Let's run the command again, and now we can see the second node, uh, and it's in the up state status and the joining state. So they are now synchronizing uh, the schema, exchanging some gossip, making sure they're all synchronized. Let's run it again. Still synchronizing. Can use the watch command to view it in real time. All right, they are both in the normal state. Uh, let's add uh, the third node. Again, you can watch them uh, joining. There it is. All 
All right. Uh, all of the nodes are in the normal state, so uh, we can start issuing commands to the cluster. And we can use the CQL shell command uh, to issue commands, and this time they will go to the entire cluster. So we'll use Docker exec and tell us that it's an interactive uh, process, so we give it the INT flag. All right, so now we are in the uh, CQL shell, and we can issue CQL commands uh, to the cluster. We'll create a key space, we can use tab completion, uh, and a key space is where your data lives, so we can specify the replication uh, factor. So we'll replicate over all, all three nodes. Let's enter that key space. And we can create a simple table. Give it the primary key and a couple of fields. Let's see the schema that we created. So there is our schema, and we can use that to create the table again on another cluster. Uh, and we can insert a couple of rows. Customary values. Let's insert another one. And now, if this were a, a real hardware, and I was, if I could type a little bit faster, then I would show you a million operations per second. But I'm quite a slow typist, so we'll we'll be satisfied with that. Let's give it a different primary key. Let's look at the data. And there is our data. So now we're going to simulate uh, a little bit of uh, a little failures. But before that, we will increase the consistency level to quorum. And that means that the Scylla will require that at least the two nodes will be up uh, uh, in order to serve the request. And each query, it will contact at least two nodes and make sure that uh, the data is the same between them uh, so that you get the consistent data. Let's do that query again with this consistency level and it's still the same data. And now we will simulate uh, a, a node going down. We will use the docker rm command to remove a node. And node 2 was just wiped from the face of the Earth. Let's see how Scylla uh, can deal with that. Uh, and actually, it doesn't look so good. It's maybe detecting the failure. That wasn't so good. All right, so it took a while to detect the failure, uh, but uh, once it did, then it is able to uh, uh, provide a response. Um, and let's simulate yet another failure uh, by pausing a node 3. So node 3 is temporarily going offline, and now I expect it not to be able to uh, deliver the data consistently. We can reduce the consistency level and uh, to 1, just to show you that uh, if you tell it to select just one node, it will work. And it works. Let's go back to Quorum. Uh, and now let's unpause node 3 to simulate it going back online. Uh, I'll give it a couple of seconds so, uh, to, to reconnect so that uh, uh, we can see the data immediately, and it works. Uh, so we can, so we, we can see that it is able to uh, uh, tolerate a node going down and going up, and everything uh, reconnects. Uh, automatically, and in a future webinar, we will also 
uh, highlight the performance and show you uh, a cluster doing uh, a million operations per second, uh, and we will show, go over the metrics so we can see exactly uh, what the cluster is doing while, while it's running. Okay, so we're, we're switching into Q&A. There are information about the upcoming releases, but uh, let, let's see if uh, we're asked about Q&A in, in that. Um, and uh, we, are, we encourage you to test these uh, resources. We have an active Slack channel where you can get quick answers for your questions and Twitter channel that uh, you, know, you can also get quick answers and, and uh, sharing of uh, YouTube and, and this uh, slide and uh, additional slides. And in a month time frame, we'll do a webinar about uh, i3 instances on Amazon and how to monitor that, how to test that you get to the really uh, uh, the, the most we, you squeeze the most performance out of it, and we'll show you how the how are the networking aspect, the CPU and the disk aspect with a live monitor of ours. And so let, let's uh, switch to um, questions, and uh, we, we can try to do that live. So the, the first one, the consistency in the demo should be just the same as Cassandra to answer this question. Avi, there was a previous question by Kirill about, uh, I think it's a, a, a hot partition, uh, how we deal with it. So I, I answer that. Is there anything on top of it that you'd like to mention? Uh, so no, that we don't have any special magic. So typically, you deal with that at the data modeling level. So you make sure that um, the data has, the, the partition key has enough randomness in it to ensure that there is a good distribution, uh, and we rely on that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing is, is to, 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 to answer this. So there are no magics, and, but it's possible to monitor that. There are two good tools to monitor. One is the uh, um, Prometheus stack that we have, and it's possible to show that uh, some cores are busier than others. So it's, it's quite important to see how many requests do they handle and what's their load with our Prometheus uh, stack. Another good uh, aspect is to use uh, the CQL tracing feature and slow query uh, uh, tracing. So I encourage you to do both. And it is, it is possible to get to the intra-core. It's not, uh, I think it's more of an in, inter-node, maybe also in, intra-core message queues. I think it's possible, and we, we monitor the size of them. And to, to answer uh, Kirill's questions. In, in terms of uh, security features, we support uh, SSL encryptions between the client and the nodes, and uh, between the nodes themselves. And the, there are also basic authorization question, uh, authorization uh, model. Uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, security features that we intend to introduce in our enterprise version as well. And, and they include uh, data in, at rest, if uh, I was asked about the encryption. And in, in terms of uh, templates for Prometheus, uh, we do provide it. Uh, it's, it's possible to, to get, get the source code of, of it and uh, get, uh, get it from the, the Docker image. And so you, you'll be able just to clone the template if you have some other Prometheus server running. So the easiest way is to just uh, start the Docker image that we provide with Prometheus and uh, Grafana, and that gets you up running in no time. But it, it, like Dor said, it's also possible to use an existing instance 
uh, with our template. In terms of uh, integration with uh, Kubernetes, uh, and Docker is first-class citizen. It's not for performance, although you can get lots of performance out of it uh, if you pin the containers uh, correctly. And I think it's uh, something an area where we'll we'll focus in the, in the future more and more. That there are production installations of uh, Scylla and Docker. And in terms of Kubernetes, uh, people are doing it on the mailing list. And I think that it's possible to find users who uh, who do that. Uh, but uh, there is even a, a patch that was recently sent. And we do not actively provide such a solution yet. But it's of a lot of interest. Uh, yes, the Kubernetes integration is coming. And there is a similar question about the AWS integration. So we provide an AMI that is uh, pre-tuned for, uh, uh, for AWS. So it has knowledge uh, of uh, the, the disk capabilities that are available uh, on uh, Amazon. So you don't need to run uh, the benchmark by the setup. You basically don't need to perform the setup tool. Uh, and uh, everything comes uh, uh, ready to run. So it's very easy. You just uh, use that AMI, launch a few instances, and you have a cluster. We also have a nice project called Cassandra Test and Deploy. It allows you to deploy Cassandra or Scylla on AWS quite easily. You can deploy clusters of uh, Cassandra and, and Scylla, and you can deploy our monitoring stack. You can add node to existing cluster or remove them. Uh, it's quite a convenient tool. It's not meant for production, but it's meant for an, an easy deployment of, uh, a, a, of this gear in order to test it. Okay, I think uh, this is it. So thanks. For all of the attendees, you're most welcome to send us questions either for uh, the public mailing list, Slack, or private emails. And share your success if you're already using AWS, Scylla and on AWS or any other platform. And we do have a time for last question, so go ahead, Jeff. Uh, the, the recording should be sent. That's right. Okay. So thanks again, everybody, for your time and for your listening. And uh, help us to make uh, Sila better. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.